Okay, here I'm going to work through this tutorial one, um, which is about vectors and rearranging equations and starting to see how some of this maths then fits into um, understanding forces um, and understanding the world. Um, so this, uh, I'll work through the whole thing um, and I'll try and work through it reasonably slowly and reasonably clearly and um, talk through everything I'm doing. Question one says, uh, a bird flies five kilometers due north and then seven kilometers due east. How far is the bird from its original position and in what direction? Uh, that's that question there, top of the screen there. Um, so this is a really good place, question one, tutorial sheet one, to make a point that might seem obvious. A lot of engineering is usefully done by drawing diagrams and this is an example of somewhere we can draw a diagram we're told that the bird starts somewhere i'm going to label that o that's quite often what we do as kind of our origin our original point um, and then we're told it flies five kilometers due north to some point there and then seven kilometers due east um, this isn't a geography module. It's probably worth knowing that east is to the right as we tend to look at things. North is up, uh, so the, the compass looks like this. Um, but it's not hugely important that you know those things. But anyway, this first line is due is five kilometers north, and this second line is seven kilometers east. And then we're asked, OK, um, how far has is the bird from its original position and in what direction? Well, the line that we're interested in there uh, is this one here. And what we need to do now is start using the different ways we understand triangles. This angle, theta, is the um, direction. It's the angle clockwise from due north, which describes the direction from the origin to be the position of the bird now. Uh, and this length here is the one we're interested in. So first of all, we'll do some trigonometry. And our trigonometry says tan theta. Remember the rules of sine equals opposite over hypotenuse uh, cos equals adjacent over hypotenuse and tan equals opposite over adjacent. Those are important rules. So tan theta equals opposite over adjacent. The side opposite the theta that we're interested in is 7 and the side adjacent is 5 and if we were doing something with sine then L would be the hypotenuse um, and 7 over 5 is 1.4 uh, theta equals and at this stage you need to go to your calculator and um, it's tan to the minus 1 of 1.4 and I get that to be 54.46. I'm going to call that 54.5 degrees. And just to be totally clear what I'm saying there, uh, I'm going to say 54.5 degrees. And it's clockwise from north. Doesn't matter so much whether you add that note or not. If you've got theta marked on your diagram, then somebody will be able to put together this 54.5 degrees with that value there. Um, now we'll use Pythagoras, uh, which says the hypotenuse squared equals the sum of the squares on the other two sides. L squared equals 5 squared plus 7 squared. Uh, which equals 25 plus 49, which equals uh, 74, I think. Um, and just check that. 5 squared plus 7 squared is 74. And if I take the square root of that, I get 8.60. So L 
and just to be clear I'm taking the square root because I had an expression for L squared and what I want is an expression for L so 8.60 for L and then I'll just finish by saying the bird is 8.60 uh, kilometers all of our units were in kilometers so this is in kilometers away on a bearing of 54.5 degrees and I will underline that so that it's clear that's what I'm saying is the really important takeaway from all this work I've been doing and that is pretty much how I would recommend you uh, write an answer to question one question two is about rearranging equations um, so question 2a says you've got 4a over 5 equals 2b over 7 and we want to write down an expression for a on its own and that's going to be the same in each of these equations we want to rearrange them so that we're just looking at something to do with a the important thing with equations is that you have to do the same thing to the left hand side as you do to the right hand side so what I'm going to do first is multiply both sides by 5. I'll go through this reasonably stepwise. As you get further into your engineering career, you might want to start doing some of this in your head. But I think at first it's always good just to be completely clear about what we're doing. So I'm multiplying both sides by 5. 4a, um, and when I multiply this by 5, it was 4a divided by 5. If I multiply by 5, then I just get 4a equals 2b times 5 all divided by 7 so in essence I'm multiplying the top line by 5 um, on both sides now what I'm going to do is divide both sides by 4 and that gives me a equals 2b times 5 over 7 times 4 so dividing by 4 is the same as multiplying the denominator by 4 and when I rearrange all of this, that gives me equals 10b over 28. Um, and then if you want, you can notice that both 10 and 28 are divisible by 2. Um, so that is 5b over 14 when I divide them both by 2. And that's our final answer there for 2a. Um, I'll keep going. This is all going to be useful practice, I think. We've got something that says 2b plus 7 equals a plus 5 over 7b um, in the first example what we were really trying to do is take all of the things that are surrounding the a and get rid of them so that you know we multiplied by 5 so that the a wasn't divided by 5 then we divided by 4 so that the a wasn't multiplied by 4 we're going to use the same kind of technique here so if I multiply both sides by 7b then I'll be left with just a plus 5 on the right hand side um, what I'll do now I will multiply through these brackets uh, 2b times 7b is 14b squared plus 7 times 7b is 49b equals a plus 5 and I'm now able to subtract 5 from both sides and I'll get 14b squared plus 49b minus 5 equals a or alternatively a equals 14b squared plus 49b minus 5 Um, I'll just try and focus a bit better there. It's a bit blurry. That didn't do the job. Uh, let's try, just try all the buttons on this. That looks a bit more focused. Okay, that should be slightly clearer. Um, so I hope that helps. Um, and that's the correct answer for B. We might just underline our final answers again. It's always just a good habit to get into so that somebody who's looking at it quickly can always jump if they 
feel like they trust your working, they can just jump to your final answer. Uh, good, that's 2A and B done. Uh, let's have a look at 2C. Moving into shot. Uh, here we've got A squared equals B squared plus 4B plus 4. Uh, we've already looked at one of these once actually when we were doing Pythagoras that if you've got something squared you want to uh, take the square root of both sides in this case. So the square root of a squared is a and the square root of b squared plus 4b plus 4 can be written just like that. One thing that um, we'll cover in maths in about week four, I think, is that we can start to factorize out expressions like this or to to um, simplify them in some way. Uh, b squared plus 4b plus 4, I'll just put a side note over on the right hand side, um, b squared plus 4b plus 4 equals b plus 2 multiplied by b plus 2. Um, and you might want to just check that, multiply out these brackets and make sure you're getting 4b plus 4, four sorry, b squared plus 4b plus 4. All of that then equals um, b plus 2 all squared. And that's useful because we can take the square root of b plus 2 all squared quite easily. So this is now the square root of b plus 2 all squared, which just equals b plus 2. The square root of something squared is that something. Uh, we can use that as a general rule over here, I suppose. The square root of z squared equals z. Sorry, I'm not sure my twos and my z's are very distinguishable there. I'll put a crossbar on the z's just to make it clear. So that's a general rule. about what square roots and squares mean. Uh, that is 2c solved. We'll keep going. Uh, 2d says x minus y equals 4b minus a. Um, again, what we want to do is remove all of the things surrounding the a so the first thing I'm going to do is divide by 4. Uh, x minus y all divided by 4 equals b minus a. Um, now, because I've got this minus a, I'm going to do this in a couple of steps. I'm going to add a to both sides, so at least I've got plus a somewhere. So that will give me x minus y all over 4 plus a equals b. And now I can take away, subtract this term from both sides, and I'll be left with a equals b minus brackets x minus y over 4. Uh, and that is the final answer. And again, just to finish off on this, I'll underline the things I'm saying in my final answer. So that's 2C and D done. Uh, 2E. This time we've got 1 over A equals 1 over B plus 1 over C. You'll see things like this come up reasonably often. Um, Obviously, the thing that's making it tricky is that everything's in the denominator, the bottom line, and ideally we'd have everything in the numerator, the top line. And the trick here is to multiply everything, or multiply both sides, by ABC. And then we get um, ABC over A equals abc over b plus abc over c and i can start to just cancel out some of that uh, that a and that a cancel out that b and that b cancel out and that c and that c cancel out 
and we're left with uh, BC equals AC plus AB. Um, now what I'm going to do is rearrange this and take out a factor of A and I'm left with BC equals A multiplied by C plus B. Or I'm going to call it B plus C. You know, the order doesn't matter when you're adding two things. And finally, I can rearrange that to say A equals BC over B plus C. And that's our answer. And 2F says B equals AC over A plus C. Well, that's a bit like the answer that we had here, but now we're coming at it from the other direction. Um, so what I'm going to do to start with, often a good idea is to get rid of the denominators, so get everything into the numerator. So if I multiply both sides by a plus c, we'll do that. b multiplied by a plus c equals ac. And that's ba plus bc equals AC, which means that BC equals um, AC minus BA, which is the same as AB, or that, sorry, I'll try and keep this all on one page just for convenience, BC equals A multiplied by C minus B, and finally dividing both sides by C minus B and switching the sides around, I'll get A equals BC over C minus B. And that's a final answer. So there are six questions like this on this um, particular question paper. And I know that there are more, I think, in lecture three in uh, your maths lectures and I can't overemphasize how important it is to be able to do all of these kinds of things um, very very smoothly and routinely they need to become habit so please practice all six of these practice the examples in your maths papers go and look up maths textbooks and find more examples you'll never um, regret being better at manipulating equations Um, okay, question three here is about resolving vectors into horizontal and vertical components. We're going to end up doing a lot of this in um, Introduction to Mechanical Engineering. So again, it needs to become second nature. Um, my advice as ever is to start these things by drawing the diagram and thinking about what you're doing. Um, you're told here in, this is 3A, that we've got an 18 Newton force at an angle of 35 degrees. And what I like to do just um, to sort of get into a habit on these things is to mark this horizontal component H and this vertical component V and then from here on it's all about trigonometry so um, practicing trigonometry is a good idea if I first of all look at sine uh, sine is opposite over hypotenuse just to be clear the hypotenuse is always the long side opposite the right angle if you're confused about where the hypotenuse is in any triangle, mark on the right angle and then find the side opposite. That's the hypotenuse. You only have a hypotenuse and you can only do trigonometry on right angled triangles. Or you can only do this simple form of trigonometry on right angled triangles. So we're going to say sine 35 equals sine is opposite over hypotenuse. The opposite side to the 35 degree angle is V, the hypotenuse is 18, and therefore V equals 18 sine 35. 
and at that stage we put it into a calculator. Ten point three two four. Let's just stick to three significant figures. So the vertical side, uh, vertical component of this force is ten point three newtons. Um, if I now do cos, I'll get cos thirty five is adjacent. The adjacent side to the thirty five degree angle is this one. That's H. So cos thirty five is adjacent over hypotenuse, and we already know the hypotenuse is eighteen. Therefore, H equals 18 cos 35. Um, 18 times cos 35 is 14.7 newtons. Um, it's worth just underlining those, I suppose, just to be clear. Uh, that those are our answers. Um, and then it's just worth thinking, I won't do this on, on all three parts of question three, what does this actually mean? It means that this 18 Newton force that we're given has exactly, which is at an angle of 35 degrees, it's not quite lined up with our coordinate system. We really want things that are at right angles, it's much easier to work at right, with um, forces at right angles. And so we're saying this unaligned force or the force that's at 35 degrees is the same has the same effect as a force which pulls with 14.7 newtons to the right and a second force that's 10.3 newtons upwards combined and that turns out to be much easier to build into a bigger system and to understand as part of a bigger system than this uh, 18 newton force was initially so a lot of the time we're going to end up taking forces which are at uh, angles to our coordinate system and resolving them into components which are aligned with our coordinate system. That's what we're doing here. So let's go straight on and do another example. Part B is this problem. Um, this angle here 82 degrees and I've drawn it slightly more confusingly here but nevertheless the um, horizontal and vertical components are those two for this triangle and the right angle is there so just being able to picture the triangles is something that um, can take a bit of concentration and thought um, this again is H, the horizontal component, and this is V, the vertical component. Horizontal from side to side, vertical up and down. Uh, again, now I can just go on and say, okay, well, sine 35, sorry, sine 82, uh, we've got an 82 degree angle here, is opposite over adjacent. The opposite side to the 82 degrees is the vertical here. So it's vertical over the hypotenuse, sorry, which I didn't mark on, that's given in the question as 1650. So it's this. And then I can rearrange that to say V equals sine 82 times 1650. I'll do that on my calculator, 1650 times sine 82. 1633.9, I'm going to call that 1634 newtons. Um, and then you've kind of got a question, does that make sense? Well, 82 degrees is quite close to 90 degrees, so this is a very, um, uh, I can't remember the names for my triangles now, uh, but it's a triangle with one, with two very long sides and one very short side. Um, and so it does make sense that this V, even the way I've drawn it here, which isn't to scale, you can see that V and the hypotenuse are going to be pretty close to the same length and we're expecting h to be a lot shorter. So let's go on and calculate h and then we'll check that that's happened. Cos 82 equals h over 1650 and then h equals 1650 times cos 82. And again I'll just go straight to the calculator times cos 82 and that comes out as 230 newtons, 229.6, which 
which I'm rounding to 230. So you can see that's a much smaller number than the vertical component and the hypotenuse, and that kind of adds up with the, the triangle that we drew in the first place. Uh, so that seems pretty reasonable. And that's 3B done. Um, a couple of things just to note, I just went and checked that the answers that I wrote earlier, you'll see if you look at the answers to these questions, um, let's just make a side note here, answers say FV equals minus 1630 newtons. Um, and that's slightly different to this 1634 that I had here. First of all, obviously, when I was um, writing this out before, I decided, I guess, to stick to always using three significant figures. That's probably a, quite a good idea. So um, I'm happy that I did that. Maybe I could have written this one here as 1630. The um, exactly how you round things in engineering there's no exact no precise way to do it if you want to you know tell somebody a very precise value for the speed of light you might need 10 or 20 significant figures whereas if you just want to tell somebody um, a very approximate number you might only want one significant figure so there's no absolute way to do it I would say if you're not quite sure stick to three significant figures which is what I've done here so I've rounded it to um, three significant figures the second thing that's different is I have made this a negative number and I guess what I was thinking there is let's stick to a general coordinate system that says this way here is uh, x positive and this direction here is y positive which means that if the force is going downwards or to the left you can represent those as negative numbers um, so it doesn't matter so much here because we're not quite sure what we're applying this to in the end but you do need somehow to bear in mind that a force going upwards will cancel out a force going da downwards and a force going to the right will cancel out a force going to the left all of this will become more familiar and um, clearer as you work on applied problems and as you work your way through the module. Uh, let's finish off with 3C, which has this setup. And we're told this angle here is 128 degrees and this magnitude is 9.6 newtons. Um, I'm just going to mark on my horizontal and vertical components and again it's getting this bit right that's actually quite um, the bit that, that requires a bit of thought I think. Um, this force is pulling downwards and to the left and that's a useful thing to have in mind what's actually you know take a step back from the detail and think what's going on here well something's being pulled down and to the left uh, so I can even put some arrowheads on there I guess if I want down and to the left and those then become the downwards component is the vertical component and the component to the left is the horizontal component and now what we need to do is work out what's happening with this triangle. Well, we've got a horizontal and a vertical, which means we've got a right angle. And there's also a right angle here. This 128 degrees is relative to the horizontal, and this line here is vertical, so the vertical and the horizontal here are separated by a right angle. Which means that this angle here I'll call theta, and what I can say is the 128 degrees is made up of theta plus a right angle. 128 degrees equals theta plus a right angle and you know that a right angle is 90 degrees and therefore theta equals 128 minus 90 which equals 38 degrees.
So now we've got everything into a position where we can just do the trigonometry as before. Um, and I can say sine theta equals, um, I'm going to write this out as opposite over hypotenuse just because I do want you to notice the position of our angle that, that we know has sort of changed here. Um, before we knew an angle relative to the uh, horizontal. So just to, to be clear, this 35 degrees and this 82 degrees are both relative to a horizontal line. Now theta is relative to a vertical line. It doesn't really matter, but you need to just remember that that will move what your opposite side is. So you need to think about the opposite side to the angle that we know is now h. Uh, so this equals h over 9.6. Um, that means, and theta is 38, so rearranging all of that, I get that h equals 9.6 sine 38, which equals 5.5. Newtons. Um, and since we set up that coordinate system in the last example where this is to the right is positive and upwards is positive, well now we're going down and to the left. So I'm going to make this a negative number. We'll call it negative 5.91 newtons because it's h is to the left and that's a negative number within our coordinate system. Uh, cos theta equals adjacent over hypotenuse. The adjacent side is the one next to the angle theta, so that's v over 9.6, and therefore v is going to be 9.6 times cos 38, which equals 6.5 7.56 newtons and again that's downwards which is negative in our system so we call that negative 7.56 newtons. Um, the really important thing here is that you're getting the the triangles right and you're getting the numbers right. If you're not quite clear on what should be a negative number and what should be a positive number that's probably not going to matter so much. So I don't want to get bogged down in that. I really want to check that you are getting the right equation that h, the horizontal component, is going to be 9.6 times sine 38 and similarly elsewhere. I better just check that that's the answer in the answers and indeed it is. So that's good news. Um, let's move straight on now to question four which is quite a nice short question. Um, a rocket has mass four point, it's a mass, I'll call it m, 4.29 times 10 to the 6 kilograms. What is its mass in SI units? <laughs> Well, I think its mass in SI units is just this. The SI unit of mass is a kilogram. Um, I guess we could call that, uh, there's a thousand grams in a kilogram. So we could call this 4.29 times 10 to the 9 grams. Check you're happy with that. Remember that a thousand is 10 to the power of 3 so that um, when we transfer from kilograms to grams we are multiplying by 10 to the power of 3 and so we get from 10 to the power of 6 we get 10 to the power of 9. Um, and I guess that equals as well, uh, now we could call that 4.29 gigagrams because you know that giga is the prefix, the SI prefix for 10 to the 9. Um, to be honest, I wouldn't do that. If I were you, I would recommend that you leave things in kilograms. So um, I'm quite happy with the answer to that question being 
um, 4.29 times 10 to the 6 kilograms. The next bit is, is kind of the more important bit. It says, what's the weight in SI units? Well, the weight is weight is mass times gravity. That's the important thing to remember here. Um, and we're on Earth, so I'm going to say G equals 9.81 meters per second per second. A lot of the time you can just approximate that as 10, um, and that'll be fine. But we'll use 9.81 since we can. So this equals 4.29 times 10 to the 6 multiplied by 9.81. which is 4.08400 um, Newtons, remember mass is in kilograms, weight is in Newtons um, and I'm going to say we'll round that to three significant figures um, so that's 42 100,000 newtons and that in turn equals 42.1 times 10 to the 6 newtons which equals 42.1 mega newtons uh, and I guess that's probably the answer I would give again a bit like we talked about how there's no exact answer about how to round something there's no complete agreement about whether it's better to leave an answer like this with the 10 to the 6 in it or whether to change multiply by 10 to the 6 to mega uh, here and to some extent it depends who your audience are and um, what your own personal preference is. Uh, the answer that I've given in the answers I see is this is 42.1 mega newtons so at least I'm being consistent with myself. Um, the question then goes on to say, uh, this is for sort of for part B, what happens if we're on the moon? Um, uh, and there gravity equals 1.61 meters per second. The acceleration due to gravity is 1.61 meters per second per second. Um, and it says determine its mass and its weight on the moon in SI units. Uh, first of all, mass doesn't depend on gravity. So the mass remains what it was before, which we wrote down as uh, 4.29 gigagrams. And then we say, okay, well, the weight equals mass times gravity equals uh, 4.29 times 10 to the 6 multiplied by this new value of gravity, 1.61, and that equals 6906900. And again, that's in newtons, weight is in newtons. Um, and that equals 6.91 times 10 to the 6 newtons. Uh, so I've rounded up to 6910000000, or however many zeros, sorry, I, didn't, I don't think I got that quite right. But I've rounded up to 6.91 times 10 to the 6. And again, as you go through your degree, you'll, get, you'll keep on getting more and more familiar with how if you've got 6 million of something, that's 6 times 10 to the 6. Um, so if you feel I jumped a step there, I promise over time that will become a familiar step. And for now, I would recommend maybe you practice um, writing out any intermediate steps and convincing yourself that this is all true and accurate. Um, and then finally, I can write that that's 6.91 mega newtons. And I can check that that is the same as what's in the answers, which is good. Sorry, 
I'm just rearranging my paperwork. Uh, let's, we're nearly there now. Um, we're getting close. Uh, question five is about finding a resultant force. So now we're kind of putting together some of the things that we did, particularly in question three, into doing some real engineering. Uh, so question five has a diagram which looks like this. I'm going to draw my diagram in a different color just so that I can, well, just because I am. So you've got some kind of screw eye uh, here and it's got one vertical force acting and that's 35 newtons and it's got another force acting down like that and that is at 30 degrees and it is 42 newtons. And it says what's the resultant force? So what we're really being asked for here is rather than writing this as two forces, can we write it as one force? Because it's much easier to analyze the effect of one force, of all the forces in combination, than, than individually. That's the kind of idea we're working with. So the first thing that I'm going to do, this 35 newtons, uh, I think in the paper that's called F1, and this is called F2. Uh, let's start just by looking at F1. Uh, the vertical component which I'm going to call F1V and sorry I know these double subscripts can become a bit of a pain but I'm not sure I know a way that I prefer of doing it you can come up with your own way of doing it but make sure you've got a system of some kind well F1 is entirely a vertical force. It points straight upwards. So I don't really have to do any trigonometry here. I know the vertical component, the, there isn't a triangle involved. The vertical component is 35 newtons and the horizontal component which is F1H equals zero newtons. Uh, that's F1 pretty much analysed. Now we can go on and look at F2. And here I'm just going to draw out the triangle. The important things are the hypotenuse is the force we know at an angle is 42 newtons. That's 30 degrees. And then we want to divide that up into um, horizontal and vertical components. Again, I'll just mark on horizontal and vertical. And now we can do some trigonometry. So sine 30 equals opposite over hypotenuse, which here equals V over uh, 42. V is the same as F. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll finish this and I'll say V equals 42 sine 30 and that equals 21. Remember that sine 30 is a half. You might find that useful at some stage. So V equals 21 newtons. Uh, cos 30 equals adjacent over hypotenuse which equals h on 42, h equals 42 cos 30, which equals 36.4, I guess I'm going to call that, newtons. So what we're saying is, uh, just to put it in the same notation as we had before, f2 V equals, and now this is where I just need to think about these positives and negatives. I'm going to say everything upwards is positive and everything downwards is negative. Everything to the right is positive and everything to the left is negative. So F2V, this force is acting downwards and to the right. I'm going to say it's minus 21 newtons. Uh, F2H well, that's to the right, so it's positive, so it is just 36.4 newtons. And now what we can do is to combine them. Uh, and I'll call that 
line so I can just choose what I want to um, F R for resultant and F R horizontal equals F1 horizontal plus F2 horizontal which equals 0 plus 36.4 which equals 36.4 newtons and this is why it was useful to break everything into horizontal and vertical components because now we can add up all the horizontal components add up all the vertical components and we've got our total resultant force F R vertical equals uh, F1 vertical plus F2 vertical which equals 35 plus minus 21 which equals 14 newtons um, I'm just going to move the paper up a bit so I can finish this on this page because what we can do finally is to draw out that triangle we've got 14 newtons upwards and we've got 36.4 to the right that's the total horizontal and vertical force acting and then this is the magnitude of FR and this is the angle the magnitude of FR squared equals 14 squared plus 36.4 squared and then when you do the calculator work you find that the magnitude of FR equals uh, 14 squared plus 36.4 squared don't forget to take the square root of that uh, 38.999 I'm going to say that's exactly 39 newtons and theta the angle well tan theta equals opposite over adjacent which equals 14 over 36.4 and therefore theta equals 14 over 36.4 and we want to take the inverse tan of that and we get theta equals 21.0 degrees um, and I guess those are our answers really for this question if you wanted you could write out a sentence saying the resultant force has magnitude 39 newtons and it acts at 21 degrees above the horizontal which is kind of what's written in the answers so that's how you do question 5 uh, question 6 got another I which has three forces acting on it the first one looks like this F1 equals 96 and that angle is 45 degrees the second one looks like this F2 equals 100 and that looks to me like it's straight up and the third one looks like this F3 equals 120 and it's got this triangle drawn which says the triangle is 3, 4, 5. Uh, so we'll look at each of these in turn. F1, I'm going to go a bit quicker on this question than I did on question 5 um, just to kind of keep it interesting I suppose uh, F1 looks like this this side here is 96 and it has some horizontal component and some vertical component and an angle of 45 degrees and we can say sine 45 equals opposite over hypotenuse that's V over 96 and therefore V equals 96 sine 45 which equals 67.9 newtons uh, cos 45 equals h over 96 uh, h equals 96 cos 45 
um, sine 45 and cos 45 are both the same value so I know that this is going to be 67.9 newtons as well but you can put that into your calculator if you want so I'll just write out uh, f1 v well it's upwards so I'm making it positive so it's just 67.9 newtons and f1 h the horizontal component of f1 that's to the left which we've tended to say is negative so i'm going to say it's negative 67.9 newtons and that's f1 calculated f2 look, looks like it should be pretty easy and in fact i can just write down the components f2v is 100 newtons it's a vertical force and f2h equals zero there's no horizontal component. Uh, F3 is just worth looking a little second at F3. Um, we're told that this is equivalent to or the angles are the same as in a 3 four five triangle and there are a couple of things that you can do here if you wanted you could uh, just calculate this theta here right you know um, you can use any of the trigonometry options to calculate theta so like tan theta equals opposite over adjacent it's four over, tan theta equals four over three and that would get you this theta the two thetas must be the same and then you could calculate V and H using that. The other thing that I can do is I can notice that the ratios of the sides have to be the same. So I can say, OK, this side over this side, V over 120 equals this side over this side. The ratio of this length to this length is the same as the ratio of this length to this length. So it equals 4 over 5. And when I rearrange that, I'll get that V equals um, 120 times 4 over 5, uh, which is 96 newtons. And similarly, I can say H over 120 equals 3 over 5. And therefore, H equals uh, 120 times 3 over 5 which equals 72 newtons so feel free to work through that by calculating this theta and then using it on this triangle but you can also use the similarity of the triangles to learn something about the ratio of the lengths of the sides and that's how I've chosen to do it here um, finally that force is up and to the right so everything will be positive and I can say F3V equals 96 newtons, F3H equals 72 newtons. Uh, and now we can go and look at the uh, resultants. FR, FRH equals F1H plus F2H plus F3H. So to find the total horizontal force, add up all the individual horizontal forces, and that equals minus 67.9 plus 0 plus 72, which equals uh, 4.1, I think. Yeah, 4.1 newtons, and FRV equals... F1V plus F2V plus F3V, which equals um, 67.9 plus 100 plus uh, 96, and that equals 263.9. Um, so that gives me a triangle which a resultant triangle which looks like this and even um, even though I'm drawing it as 
quite an exaggerated triangle. Sorry, I'll move it into a shot. I probably haven't even exaggerated that enough. This length is 4.1 and this length is 263.9. Um, I guess we can just go back and say, does that make sense? It, it kind of does, right? All of these three forces are pulling upwards in some way. So we expect to have quite a big force acting upwards. And the pull to the left from F1 kind of looks like it's going to be balanced by the pull to the right from F3. So we had to use the maths to find out the exact numbers, but we also use some kind of intuition to check, does that kind of make sense? And I would say yes, overall we expect that the effect of these three is going to be pretty much to be pulling straight up in total. Um, again, I'll finish this pretty quickly, I think. The magnitude of FR is going to be the square root of 263.9 squared plus 4.1 squared. That's trigonometry on that triangle. 263.9 squared plus 4.1 squared. <laughs> and that comes out at 263.9 when you round it. So the hypotenuse is ever so slightly longer than the um, opposite side, but not much longer. And so it, to, to four significant figures, in fact, they're the same. Uh, theta is going to be tan to the minus one of opposite over adjacent 263.9 over 4.1. And that is going to be... eighty nine point one degrees um, and again you could write out a sentence saying the force has a magnitude of two six three point nine degrees and it's basic it's at eighty nine point one degrees to the horizontal or you could say it's less than one degree from vertical so in many applications depending on how precise you needed to be you might end up just rounding that to 90 degrees and saying it's a vertical force. But again, that's something where you end up using your intuition to decide what to do. OK, there's one question left to go and then we're done on this examples paper. So question seven, it looks a bit fiddly. Um, I think it's all right, actually, but it just it needs a bit of thought about where the different triangles are. So we've got some kind of a structure that looks like this. Um, and we've got the ground. I'm gonna, I, I want to just lightly shade this structure. I'm gonna try and find a pencil just so I can shade this, just so I'm clear that it is um, all or one thing so that it looks like the diagram I was given um, and then just notice we're given this vertical line and when you're given information usually that means somehow it's going to be helpful um, uh, then let's just mark on this is some kind of a mooring rope I would guess that's the kind of thing it looks like um, and that point there is A. And then there's a force which is pushing there. Uh, F1 equals 500. And this point here is marked as B. And we know that there's also a force within this that's acting along the length of this thing that I'm calling a mooring cable. Oh, yeah, mooring cable, it's in the question. Um, and that says F2 equals 300 and that's acting down in that direction uh, resolve these into a single force let's just find any other information that might be useful we're told this is three meters um, we're told this is six meters and we're told this is 60 degrees uh, that's alpha and the question says find alpha that's going to be useful because we need alpha or something like it to be able to break down f2 into its horizontal and vertical components um what i'm going to start with is this triangle bcd 
in a way with questions like this you just sort of that you have to come at them from a sense of I'm just going to try a few things and see what works and and obviously here I know what's going to work so it's a bit simpler for me um, but look for things that you can calculate and then just add them in and one of the things that's happening with triangle BCD we've got an angle and we've got a length and that actually means we can calculate everything uh, the other two sides of BCD so if I just look at that triangle on its own uh, B C D and this is 60 and this is 6 I can say that sine 60 again the 6 is the hypotenuse B D is the opposite side so that equals opposite over hypotenuse and therefore B D equals uh, 6 sine 60 which equals 5.20 meters um, one thing that you'll notice up until now when we've been doing stuff with triangles we've been resolving forces into their horizontal and vertical components and so we've been um, getting answers in newtons here we're actually looking at the geometry of a structure and so we're getting answers in meters and it's worth just reflecting on that for a second and thinking about the fact that we can use trigonometry to do different things uh, cos 60 equals CD over 6 here that's adjacent over hypotenuse and therefore CD equals 6 cos 60 and I'm pretty sure that's just going to be 3 cos 60 is a half so now we've got some good information because now we can look at a second triangle which is the triangle ABD and now what we know is that this length here is 5.20 and uh, AC was 3 meters, CD is 3 meters, so this length is 6 meters. And that angle is alpha. And therefore, alpha equals tan to the minus 1 opposite over adjacent. And that equals forty point nine degrees. Finally, we've got to think about that, how that helps us with F2. Um, well, I guess one way that we could think about that is to label this angle as, um, call it beta, since it's the angle next to B. And that means beta equals, that's a right angle. The angles inside the triangle have to add up to 180. So it's 180 minus alpha minus 90 which equals 180 minus 40.9 minus 90 and that equals 49.1 degrees Uh, once we've got that, we can start to look at the forces on their own now. Uh, if I start F1 horizontal equals 500, it's pointing to the right, so I'm going to make it positive to the uh, a positive number, and F1 vertical equals zero. It's a horizontal force only. Now we can look at a triangle for F2 and we know what's going on in the triangle because F2, the angle between, I'll just bring this down a second, the angle between F2 and the vertical is the same as the angle between AB and the vertical and that's the angle beta. Um, and that means that F2, which is 300, and 
49.1 are both known on this triangle. Um, this is then vertical and horizontal. That's the right angle. That's the known angle. So I can say, working from this triangle here, sine 49.1 equals opposite over hypotenuse. That's h over 300. And therefore, h equals 300 times sine 49.1. And that equals 226.7. Uh, newtons. I suppose that 500 was also in newtons, just to be clear. Uh, cos 49.1 equals V over 300, and therefore V equals 300 cos 49.1, which equals 196.7. Newtons. Um, and that's down and to the left and both of those we said are going to be negative and you can see again on the diagram that the, the horizontal component of F2 is going to oppose the horizontal component of F1 so that makes sense. So I'll make both of those negative just to, to make that um, that clear. Another thing that you can do, by the way, instead of um, always putting in positive and negative numbers, you can just make a note. Sometimes you'll see me do things like this, that this horizontal component is to the left and this hor this vertical component is downwards. And then again, you, you can use that just to remind yourself what's going to add up and what's going to kind of cancel each other out. So different ways to do things, but it, practice will always help, I think. So we've got everything, uh, I'll just finished by writing out what that means. That means that F2H equals minus 226.7 Newtons. F2V equals minus 196.4 Newtons. And now what I can do is to start thinking about what that means for the resultant. FR vertical equals F1 vertical plus F2 vertical, which equals 0 plus minus 196.4, and that equals 196, minus 196.4 newtons. FR horizontal equals F1 horizontal plus F2 horizontal, which equals 500 plus minus 226.7 uh, and I'll use a calculator for that 500 226.7 is 273.3 and just thinking about what those mean a negative number for a vertical component is downwards a positive number for a horizontal component is to the right and that kind of makes sense when you look at the original problem that the force the resultant force is going to be downwards and to the right uh, so we can finish up by working out the uh, magnitude and angle here. We've got a triangle that looks like this. This is 273.3. This is minus 196.4. And this is theta. And this is the magnitude of the resultant force. And by now you know the magnitude is by Pythagoras, the square root, sorry, uh, I put these in the wrong place, so just noticed it's the horizontal force, which is 273.3, and the vertical force is 196.4, and I don't really need the negative because I've got it pointing downwards now. The negative just told me that it was pointing downwards. Anyway, the um, magnitude is going to be 273.3 squared plus 196.4 squared, all square rooted. which comes out as 336.5 
uh, I'm going to call that 337 newtons and the angle theta um, well tan theta would be opposite over adjacent so theta equals tan to the minus one of opposite over adjacent and that's 196.4 over 273.3 and that equals thirty five point seven degrees uh, and since I've got space on this page I'll just write out a final answer that uh, the resultant force is uh, three three seven newtons at an angle of 35.7 degrees below horizontal to the right. And I'll make it clear that that's my final answer. Um, so that I think is kind of how I would go about answering question seven. You'll notice if you're eagle-eyed, I've said 337 and in the answers is 336. So I assume uh, when I was answering these before to get to those answers, I did a slightly different bit of rounding. Um, and within engineering in general, those kind of differences, we're not going to worry too much about it. You may end up doing a final year project where you need to be extremely precise and in that case um, you'll probably want to in any case do all of the computation using in as, leaving in as many significant figures as possible which probably means leaving a computer to do the maths for you but here the important thing is really the understanding and being able to see how the maths relates to the engineering what we've got out of all of this is that we know from having two individual forces acting on the structure we now know that there's one force acting down and to the right at the point B and we can start to look at whether that's going to do any damage to our structure or not much more easily than when we're looking at two separate forces. So that's the advantage of these kinds of calculations. And that is tutorial sheet one complete. Uh, good luck with it and do practice all of these things. Um, it's not enough obviously just to um, know roughly how they work you have to be able to do them in your sleep and do all of these calculations uh, particularly the trigonometry and the rearranging equations um, just without thinking about it because that's going to keep on coming up throughout your degree uh, good luck and let me know if you've got any questions and uh, yeah all the best